This presentation is about um, penicillin. Okay, so, in this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, a brief um, introduction to penicillins. We're going to talk a bit about the chemistry. We're going to talk about the mechanism of action. So, I put this as an acronym. So, that's basically mechanism of action. Um, we'll be talking about the classification of penicillins, we'll be talking about the pharmacology, we'll talk about the clinical use and the adverse effects. Um, so that uh, would be what this lecture is all about. So let's look at uh, uh, say soil and let's say this is uh, this is a bit of uh, this is a cross section of uh, um, uh, field say okay. and so there presumably there are uh, decaying matter so let's say that's decaying matter. And um, if we take a bit of soil from this, so this is a cross section. Okay, and uh, say this is the field. Okay, so this is the field. Um, say a vegetable patch. Okay. Uh, and we take a cross section of that, and maybe from somewhere there, we take a sample of the soil. And we we could uh, put this sample in a test tube like that, okay, and then we can put, uh, say, some water, okay, and then we could uh, maybe give this a shake, okay, and uh, then we could uh, uh, decant and maybe filter it with a Wattman filter. Okay, so this would uh, retain bacteria. Okay. Um, and one part we could maybe take a sample of this liquid and then put it in another test tube. But here we could give a medium for the culture of fungi. Okay. And we have retained bacteria here and that could be washed into another test tube, okay, and we could um, add um, media for, a liquid media for bacteria, okay, and then we could incubate both of this and then uh, we could inoculate uh, plates. Um, this into another plate, okay, which uh, facilitates the growth of uh, fungus and bacteria. And uh, what we would obtain is uh, saprophytic organisms. 
And uh, um, if we would do further studies, we'd find that the saprophytic organisms could be bacteria. And uh, fungi, okay? And the common, we would uh, further do identification study and we'd find that uh, this bacteria are usually of the bacillus species like bacillus cereus. And in fung fungi, we would uh, possibly obtain um, penicillium species. So this is what we would find from this uh, sort of uh, a, an experiment that we do. And this would be our results. We'd find saprophytic bacteria and we'd find saprophytic uh, organisms like uh, penicillium. So what is a saprophytic organism? Right, so which uh, is basically decomposes. Okay, they break down organic matter um, in the environment. Okay, so what we understand from this um, experiment would be that uh, both these type of organisms are present in this soil, bacteria as well as uh, fungi. Okay, so there is a competition uh, between these organisms. So now if we think about it, there would be... Uh, competition between competition between uh, this bacteria and this fungi uh, for food okay and what is this food this um, organic matter so there will be a competition between bacteria and fungi for food Okay, so both these organisms would be trying to survive in a, an environment where uh, uh, presumably here, in this case, uh, where food is scarce. So both these organisms would be competing for this food. And uh, for them to survive, they need a survival advantage. And what would be the survival advantage? Uh, they cannot move away because they are not motile. So the strategy that they would adopt to survive in such an environment would be to, to produce uh, chemicals. Okay, and what chemicals specifically? The fungi would produce uh, penicillin and uh, uh, for the bacteria to survive in an environment containing penicillin, the bacteria would produce a beta lactamase. Okay, so this penicillin is a beta lactam antibiotic. And uh, the bacteria would produce beta lactamase, which degrades the beta lactam antibiotic and which would enable the bacteria to survive. Um, so, this would be the chemical ecology or as to why penicillin or beta lactamase should be produced by these organisms. So possibly uh, spores of this uh, fungi, um, spores of this uh, fungi, uh, if you're in another part of the world, uh, would have uh, presumably be blown in by the wind or maybe this uh, fungi was uh, colonizing the, the ceiling or of the lab of uh, uh, Alexander Fleming. And possibly they would have settled on the culture plate that was inadvertently left open. And... Uh, um, that would have led to the serendipitous discovery of penicillin. Okay. Uh, and the rest 
is history. Sir Alexander Fleming christened this mold as Penicillium notatum. So this mold is also known as Penicillium chrysogena. The DNA of the original mold of uh, Sir Alexander Fleming has um, been sequenced and now this uh, species is named as Penicillium rubens. Sir Alexander Fleming uh, received the Nobel Prize along with uh, Florey and Chain. They received the Nobel Prize in medicine in the year 1945. So, Florey, Chain, and okay, so Alexander, Florey, and Chain, they received the Nobel Prize in Medicine um, in the year 1945. It was Dr. Ernst uh, B. Chain. who elucidated the structure of penicillin. And this was the structure of penicillin elucidated by Dr. Um, Chain. Um, so this is the this was the structure propounded for penicillin G um, because of the presence of this benzyl side chain. It's also called benzyl penicillin. So the reason that it was named uh, penicillin G was because um, um, when the mold was uh, fermented and um, the compounds were isolated, uh, it was seen there were compounds like, uh, they were called the penicillin uh, F, uh, K, X and penicillin G. But these compounds, however, were not as active as penicillin G. So, therefore, this uh, fraction, the penicillin G fraction, was subsequently um, crystallized and that became uh, the one that was followed up for clinical use and it was, um, it could be crystallized um, relatively easily from the uh, mother liquor, okay, where uh, it was uh, fermented in the first place. Okay, so, yeah, so that's how, um, uh, that's why it was named uh, penicillin G. Penicillin G. 
penicillin G became the mainstay for the treatment of uh, pneumococcal streptococcal meningococcal and uh, gonococcal Uh, infections. At this time, what was also known was that um, um, penicillin um, G had a T half of about uh, 30 minutes. Okay. And it was also known that uh, it was not very stable it was not very stable in acid okay. um, those were the um, uh, limitations but uh, the clinical use um, continued for the want of uh, anything better However, as um, time went on and uh, evidence upon evidence um, were reported, uh, uh, it was seen that uh, there were uh, resistance uh, to penicillins by these organisms. So, pneumococcal, streptococcal, and gonococcal uh, infections became in increasingly resistant to penicillin G. Okay. Um, and that combined with the fact that it had a very short T half and it was not stable in acid uh, led to the question. Um, and the question was, could uh, the structure be modified to improve its activity? Um, and so what, it, what was observed was, um, what was thought was, um, um, could the side chain uh, be modified um, and uh, would that modification have any um, bearing on the activity? Okay, so that was one of the thought processes. Um, and so it was... Um, observed that if you could uh, restrict um, the diet of the growing mold in the, in the uh, mother liquor, then you could end up with, um, uh, with, with a structure like this. So, um, uh, so this structure here, okay. Um, so this um, is this structure is six APA, and APA here being um, amino penicillinic. Acid. So this precursor here that we see uh, was found uh, amenable to uh, changes in the side chain. It was uh, easy to chemically synthesize um, derivatives. Okay, so this became the starting point for um, the uh, synthesis of analogs. Um, but what's important to remember here is that uh, this is what uh, was obtained um, naturally. Okay? So this was obtained um, um, by a natural fermentation process. And uh, 
this precursor was then chemically modified. Therefore, the, the, the penicillins that were obtained after this process, they are called semi-synthetic. So, iterative studies and standalone studies led to um, varying kinds of semi synthetic penicillins. Um, so, how they were different from um, penicillin G was that um, um, uh, so the advantages that they had was uh, there was um, um, some of the Semi-synthetic penicillins were uh, resistant to acid uh, degradation. Okay. So some of them had a greater spectrum of activity. So if you think about this, uh, um, mostly uh, penicillin G has uh, activity against gram-positive and very less activity against uh, gram negative and uh, you know um, uh, no activity against atypical organisms like uh, pseudomonas okay so um, the semi uh, semi synthetic drugs were synthesized to confer um, advantages which uh, penicillin g did not have okay so what was developed were penicillins, uh, penicillin analogs um, that were resistant to acid degradation, which were uh, chemically stable, um, meaning they had a greater T half, okay? And uh, they had a broader spectrum of activity. Okay, so these concerns um, um, or the limitations of uh, penicillin G were addressed, uh, were sought to be addressed by semi-synthetic penicillins. And those uh, semi-synthetic penicillins with these advantages um, began to be used clinically. And which are those uh, semi-synthetic penicillins? Uh, those uh, semi-synthetic penicillins which uh, have got all these um, advantages um, are um, um, the ones that are clinically used and those, uh, the names of those uh, become the classification um, they result in the classification of uh, penicillins Okay, so clinically, whatever um, advantages were uh, obtained by uh, uh, the semi-synthetic uh, penicillins um, made them useful for different um, clinical conditions. And um, when we have uh, groups of drugs which are used for uh, different uh, clinical advantages, uh, it leads intuitively to the classification of Penicillins, and that's what we're going to discuss now. So the first class is um, benzyl penicillin itself. Um, as we alluded to, this is also called penicillin G. Um, what was the disadvantage of benzyl penicillin? Yes, it had, um, it has a T half of only about 30 minutes. Okay, so um, the semi-synthetic ones that were produced were um, benzyl uh, penicillin and its uh, long-acting It's long acting parental formulations. 
Okay. So, um, under this first classification, we are looking at uh, benzyl penicillin itself, uh, but it has its uh, uh, disadvantages in that its T half is about half an hour, and therefore semi-synthetically long-acting parenteral formulations were uh, prepared. Okay, and um, uh, so what are the uh, long-acting uh, parenteral formulations? The long-acting parenteral formulations, there are basically two, and one is uh, penicillin G procaine. So why is it long acting? So benzyl penicillin, what's the T half? So T half of benzyl penicillin is about 30 minutes. Okay, and um, uh, this is long acting. So what's the advantage here? It's got a T half of about 12 hours. Okay, so it's able. We give it, give an injection and the serum concentration would be maintained for about uh, 12 hours, okay? So that's the advantage of uh, this long-acting formulation here and why it was made in the first place. So it's indicated for um, neurocephalus, okay? So what's the causative agent? Yeah, right, treponema pallidum. Okay. Um, and um, we said that it's a parenteral formulation, so it's injected uh, uh, intramuscularly. Okay. Okay. So that's the uh, first parenteral formulation. The second one is um, uh, is uh, penicillin G benzathene, okay? Penicillin G benzathene, okay? This again uh, is a long-acting preparation. What's the advantage here? The T half is approximately about uh, one month. Okay, again, what's the indication? Indication is same, cephalus. Okay, so those are the long-acting parenteral formulation of a benzyl penicillin G. Uh, so what we need to remember here is penicillin G itself uh, hasn't changed. Okay, so therefore... Um, these penicillins, they are also called, uh, they are also called uh, uh, they are also called natural penicillins. Okay, so they are also called natural penicillins because uh, we have not uh, modified it at the um, we have not brought about uh, structural, uh, um, the side chain hasn't uh, changed uh, per se, okay? Um, so penicillin G is in a matrix of procaine and uh, here penicillin G is in a matrix of benzathine, okay? So that's why we call them uh, again. Uh, natural penicillins. Before we go into the next uh, class, let us uh, remind us of the structure again. So we said that um, uh, penicillin G had certain disadvantages and um, we said that uh, uh, there have been thoughts of modifying the six amino penicillinic acid uh, uh, structure at this particular region. This um, try to include side chains uh, in this area here. So that brings us to um, 
an understanding that uh, people who worked on it found that um, um, this ring was essential for the activity. So if we um, change the structure of this ring here, uh, it wouldn't have any antibacterial activity. Whereas, um, if uh, this ring was not uh, essential for activity. Okay, so, uh, so this ring that we have highlighted here, this is called a beta lactam ring. So, the beta lactam ring is essential for, for activity. Okay, what activity? Antibacterial activity. Okay, so what's this ring called? It's got a sulfur uh, moiety out here, and this is called a thiazolidine ring. Okay. Okay. Uh, thaya meaning sulfur. Okay. Uh, so, what's the uh, basic structure of uh, penicillin? The basic structure of penicillin is the six amino penicillinic acid structure. Okay. And that structure is made up of two rings the beta lactam ring and the thiazolidin um, ring, ring. Okay. And uh, how are semi synthetic penicillins different from? Uh, benzyl penicillin, it is uh, the side chain. Okay, so the side chain um, modification is what makes um, semi synthetic penicillins different from uh, natural benzyl penicillin G. The other thing to remember here is um, the uh, available natural benzyl penicillin uh, G is um, a salt of uh, sodium or potassium. Okay, it's a salt of of either sodium or potassium. Uh, potassium salt um, is more common. Okay, so what happens here is this: uh, the potassium ion comes and attaches here, so you have COOK plus, okay? COO minus and K plus. So that is the potassium salt. So why is it made as a potassium salt or a sodium salt? It's because there is increased uh, solubility. Okay? So that's, uh, that's uh, what we need to um, remember as we continue with our discussion. So the next class is, uh, let's write it down here, the next class, sorry, the next class is Orally absorbed pencil. Okay. So, what did we say? We said that uh, benzyl penicillin is not um, acid stable. Okay. So, that was overcome by uh, semi synthetically producing orally absorbed penicillins and uh, the example here would be penicillin V. Okay. So let's just see what this structure looks like. It is
Okay, let's have that reference structure. And uh, here uh, we'd have the ring coming down. Okay. And we'll draw the beta lactam ring up there and the thiazolidin ring. Okay, so we have got this reference structure and how is this different from benzyl penicillin G? So in benzyl penicillin G, uh, what we had is, let me draw it up here. Uh, we had So then we had uh, this structure continuing uh, like that. Okay, so that's a beta lactam ring, that's a thiazolidin ring. And uh, here uh, we have, uh, uh, there should be an H here, okay as well, NH, okay? All right, so this uh, is the structure of benzyl penicillin G, and this is the structure of um, penicillin V, okay? Uh, so the point is, um, here this uh, oxygen has got a lone pair, and that lone pair kind of pulls the electron inside, and so we have got uh, the... Uh, lone pair moving like that in that direction, uh, which makes uh, this ring kind of uh, stable. Okay, so if we have, uh, let's draw it uh, chemically so that we get uh, better understanding. So we have got, let's draw again the structure of uh, benzyl penicillin G. Okay, so CH2, NH, and here we have the ring. Okay, so that's the beta lactam ring, and this is uh, benzyl penicillin, okay, or penicillin G. Okay, so this pe benzyl penicillin G, we said it is um, not stable in acid. Why is it not stable in acid? Because in the presence of uh, acid, what's going to happen is, uh, this structure gets um, uh, changed, okay, it, it uh, gets uh, changed and that's the reason why um, uh, it becomes unstable. So what's the change? We've got uh, this benzyl uh, penicillin G, uh, it gets converted to what is called uh, penilic acid, okay, and what's the structure there? Let's uh, trace out the structure. Um, and then that part of the structure is uh, uh, is the same. So what changes is this uh, ring, the beta lactam ring changes, okay? So uh, we would have a ring like that, okay? And uh, there would be a hydrolysis as well. Um, so this structure is called uh, penilic acid. Okay, so that structure is uh, 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 penilic acid. Okay, so let's see if the valency is fulfilled. One, two, okay, there should be a, a double bond there. Okay, so that is penilic acid. Okay, so what what has happened essentially here is that the beta lactam ring has got uh, changed. It's it's changed its structure. So when we said 
uh, when we talked about the requirement, we said that the beta-lactam ring is essential for activity. And here we say, in the presence of uh, acid, what has happened is, uh, the benzyl penicillin ring becomes penicillic, uh, penilic acid. Okay? And the beta-lactam uh, structure is lost, and therefore this does not have activity. Okay? Does not have antibacterial activity. Okay? So that's the reason why uh, this drug was developed. So essentially what happens here is um, uh, the presence of this electron withdrawing group here uh, stabilizes this ring. Okay? So if this ring gets stabilized, what happens is um, it won't break into, it won't form a penilic acid. So as a result, the activity would be retained. And um, why is this important? Because uh, this drug can be given orally. Okay? So we take a tablet that goes into the stomach. In the stomach, in a normal person, normal person meaning a normal person with a normal physiology would have uh, production of hydrochloric acid. And so this drug, if we give it as uh, penicillin V, then... Um, uh, it wouldn't uh, degrade in the acid of the stomach. As a result, it would be orally active. Okay, so that's the reason why this class was developed. Okay, so this uh, is the structure of penicillin uh, V. Okay. Uh, okay, so that's the structure of penicillin uh, V. And uh, okay, how is it different from uh, penicillin G? We have seen. Okay. So, based on the structure we, and uh, the degradation in acid, uh, we can um, explain why penicillin B, V should be uh, stable in acid and therefore it can be given orally. Okay. So, uh, it's now quite intuitive why it is called orally active, orally absorbed penicillin. Okay, it is... Um, uh, indicated would be the indication. It is uh, indicated for uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infections. Okay. Okay, it's indicated for upper respiratory tract infections, uh, for uh, tonsillitis, uh, those kind of infections. Okay, um, and what would be the causative organism? It would be most likely streptococcal. Okay. Infections. Okay, uh, but we need to remember that. Um, um, this drug would be indicated only after uh, we do sensitivity studies, okay? So, after sensitivity testing, if uh, this drug is found uh, effective, then it should be uh, used, but then it's uh, uh, subjected to diagnostic test, okay? But, um, yeah, this can be given orally, okay? So, that's the... Um, point that uh, we leave with when we leave this classification of drugs, uh, this classification of uh, penicillin. Oops. Um, the next class is um, beta lactamase resistant penicillins. So once upon a time, the Staphylococcus were sensitive to penicillin. Okay, but uh, it's not the case anymore. Okay, because uh, most of the Staphylococcus, they have Staphylococcus, um, the Staphylococci, um, have developed, uh, have uh, 
become resistant to penicillins because they produce an enzyme called beta lactamase. Okay. So what does beta lactamase do? We can understand that by looking at the structure of benzyl penicillin again. Okay. So let's draw another structure of uh, benzyl penicillin. Okay, so this is uh, benzyl penicillin or penicillin G. Okay, so in the presence of beta lactamase, um, what happens is this structure gets degraded like this. Um, so this uh, structure, uh, it gets degraded to this uh, structure. So this structure is uh, penicilloic acid. Okay, so in the presence of uh, beta lactamase, the beta lactam structure is again lost, and we said beta lactam is necessary for antibacterial activity. As a result, in the presence of beta lactamase, the penicillins uh, lose the integrity of their structure, and they are no more. Um, um, they don't uh, have the activity anymore. Okay, so that's the. Um, uh, that is why there was a need for beta lactamase resistant penicillins to be developed. And uh, the penicillins that were developed, uh, they are, um, uh, there was a chemical modification to produce um, isoxazole penicillins. And uh, the penicillins were uh, cloxacillin, uh, dicloxacillin, flu, cloxacillin, okay, flu, cloxacillin, um, and uh, oxacillin. Okay. And the other um, penicillins that were developed, which had uh, beta lactamase um, resistance, were methicillin and uh, nafcillin. Okay. So these are the beta lactamase resistant uh, penicillins. Um, so the problem is, uh, there has, uh, the staphylococci have developed resistance even to methicillin. Um, so much so that uh, such uh, resistant strains are now called methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus, okay? Methicillin resistant. Focus aureus. Okay. So MRSA. Okay. So what's the treatment for MRSA then? So currently, for MRSA, the drug of uh, choice uh, is uh, vancomycin. Okay. So that's just for uh, your information. Okay. Uh, so the point is Staphylococcus aureus, the resistance is now becoming very, very um, critical, okay? That's uh, um, 
that's a challenge that we are facing in the clinic. Okay, so, yeah, so, uh, but uh, having said that, there are also strains currently which are sensitive to Staphylococcus aureus. So we have methicillin sensitive uh, strains um, in patients and therefore that's the relevance of these beta lactamase resistant penicillins. So these uh, drugs are indicated for infections like uh, um, skin and uh, soft tissue infections. Okay, so they are indicated for, let's write it down here. Um, they are, so they are indicated for um, skin and uh, soft tissue infections and infections like uh, endocarditis. So those are the those are some of the uh, infections, and also the indication would be for methicillin sensitive Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, methicillin sensitive. So those are the most important indications for um, this class of uh, penicillins. Um, the next class, uh, let's write it somewhere here. Um, the next class is um, extended spectrum penicillins. Okay. So by this um, extended spectrum, what is meant is um, um, increase in the spectrum of organisms stained um, using gram stain, gram stain, okay? So we alluded to previously that uh, benzyl penicillin was more active against uh, gram positive. So um, extended spectrum penicillins increase the spectrum of activity from gram positive towards gram negative. And that is what is uh, meant by extended spectrum penicillins. Um, so uh, specifically, the extended spectrum penicillins have... Um, 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 increased activity against uh, Haemophilus influenzae, um, some gram negative bacilli, and uh, Listeria species. So that's, uh, that's the advantage of um, um, modification of the 6-amino penicillinic acid nucleus, um, which results in extended spectrum penicillins. So what are the representative drugs? So the most um, important drugs in this um, class are uh, amino penicillins, okay? So the amino penicillins, okay? And uh, example would be um, ampicillin, 
and uh, esters of ampicillin. Okay, what could be the examples of uh, ampicillin esters? You're right. Becampicillin, tal ampicillin, piv ampicillin. Okay, interesting to note that uh, they have only a, they are different only in their prefixes. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's uh, back ampicillin, tal ampicillin, and pev ampicillin. Okay, so ampicillin and uh, esters, and uh, the other. Um, Examples would be moxicillin, and uh, mesilinam. Okay. Okay. So these are the most important. Um, Examples of extended spectrum penicillins. Um, so the problem is certain, uh, you know, the Haemophilus uh, influenzae species, species, and some uh, Enterobacteriaceae. They have developed uh, resistance. Again, we are the production of uh, beta lactamases. Okay, so the approach that has been adopted uh, because of this reason, uh, the approach has been to, uh, to combine amino penicillins. is to combine amino penicillins um, with beta lactamase inhibitors. Okay. So beta lactamase inhibitors uh, inherently lack antibacterial activity, meaning they have uh, no antibacterial activity by themselves. But what they do is when there are organisms producing beta-lactamases, they um, inhibit the activity of those uh, beta-lactamases, which makes uh, the amino penicillins more stable in the presence of beta-lactamases. So as a result, the spectrum considerably improves. So the beta-lactamase inhibitors, the examples would be, um, there are three basically, and the three beta-lactamases which are used clinically are uh, sulbactam, uh, tazobactam, and uh, clavulanic acid. So those are the examples of beta lactamases. Uh, so combination of um, ampicillin with um, beta lactamase inhibitors are available in the market. Similarly for amoxicillin. Okay. All right. Um, so they are indicated in um, upper respiratory. Uh, tract infection. Spirit 
respiratory tract infections, for example, in sinusitis, there's and maybe otitis media. Um, and maybe um, helicobacter pylori in the um, um, GIT, in the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, so mostly it's for upper respiratory tract infections. And mind you, they are often combined with um, beta-lactamase um, inhibitors. So that's uh, the most important information regarding this class of uh, uh, penicillins. And the next class of drugs are, uh, the next class of penicillins are um, penicillins active against pseudomonas aerogenous. Okay. So pseudomonas aerogenosa is um, gram negative uh, bacilli. Okay, it's gram negative. So this class of drugs have extended activity um, against gram um, negative uh, bacilli like uh, pseudomonas aerogenosa. Okay, and um, the, there are two chemical classes which are which are important uh, examples of this class, and um, the chemical class being um, acyl uridyl penicillins, acyl uridyl penicillins, and the examples would be azelocillin. Um, and uh, similar drugs like uh, mevslocillin and uh, hyperacillin. Okay. So these are uh, representative examples of acyl uridopenicillins. Um, the other chemical class uh, which are important um, examples of uh, um, uh, penicillins active against Pseudomonas aerogenosa are the carboxy penicillins. And uh, the most important example of uh, carboxy penicillins is carbenicillin. So um, that finishes our uh, discussion on the classification of penicillins. Okay, so we said what are the different classifications of uh, penicillin. So the different uh, classes of uh, penicillins are um, benzyl penicillins and their long-acting parenteral formulations, then orally active penicillins and beta-lactamase-resistant penicillins, extended-spectrum penicillins, and um, the penicillins active against pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay. 